Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, I think the original one was for 2020, so I'm a bit late in arrival, but I'm, I'm claiming it's not my fault. Right? I'm claiming there are other factors beyond my control. The COVID period taught me to change my emphasis, to be quite honest. So being a teacher on retirement, most of the books were designed to cause children to think and reflect on the human story, which I find absolutely fascinating. Step two, um, I love this city and I want to understand it. So one, two, three, I think the mining base or the economic base of a city determines the nature and culture and uh, of that city. So three down, and if you listen very, very carefully, you can hear the fourth one being printed at Waller and Chester as I stand here in front of you. So that should be out in a week or two. But COVID taught me the, the joy and the benefits of community. And that is what I want to do. So this is initially, I thought, a little bit frivolous. It's just the celebration of this community. But you can't stop thinking and reflecting about what you're reading, can you? We're talking about human beings suffering, human beings having joy and pleasure in life, human beings succeeding, human beings not succeeding. It starts out as just joy and pleasure, but it then gets a little bit better. So it was a little bit at the start, Stephen Fry. It was a little bit of uh, QI, quite interesting. And indeed, I've found some quite interesting people to tell you about today. But it became a bit obvious that it was more than quite interesting. There was a, quite a large list of these people who were coming to uh, Ballarat, and there must be a reason why we're getting so many that wanted to make this long and dangerous journey. Now, visitors I'm talking about, I'm not talking about people here on official business or people here to mine, I'm people who came here to, uh, what's the Australian phrase, gawk, <laughs> to have a look, to have a look to see what was uh, happening in this particular place. I got sidetracked in a way onto those that I found, I can't believe this, this is incredible, I didn't know this person came to Ballarat, and I did not include the two most famous visitors to Ballarat, and that was a mistake. And it's a mistake because they tell you the main thrust of it, the main reason. Now, the two people that I missed, well, there's serendipity for you. There's one of them. There's Alfred up there from the 1860s, Prince Victoria's, uh, Queen Victoria's uh, son. And he came here and this was a great day of Ballarat's tremendous celebration and joy. It's nothing to do with royalty, if you ask me. <laughs> Virtually nothing to do with royalty anyway. It's Ballarat showing off. Oh, look at this. And he was taken on the obligatory tour. One mine, one factory, one trip up Sturt Street and Lydiard Street, the Benev, to use a Ballarat phrase, the base, the base hospital, once round the lake, back to Craig's. That's what they did with them all. That's what they did with Barclay. That's what they did with virtually every to every visitor that came to the city. And this was Willie Cannon, and I'll tell the story, I'm sorry about the U3A class who heard this last Tuesday, you're going to hear it again. The best story about this day is Willie Cannon is the, uh, the guy, the miner, who is selected to take the man, the prince, down that mine. And, of course, it's set up. Why don't you try over here? And, of course, he finds gold. The prince was over the moon excited. And the next day, a purse of sovereigns comes. Share this amongst the men who took me down that mine. It was returned. Not with chip on shoulder, not with anger, but with dignity. We enjoyed doing what we did. We're looking you straight in the eye, man to man. You're the prince, we're the miners. And it was done at that level of dignity. That would not have happened in Britain in 1867, 1837 or any other time. This is men who, because they had something in their back pocket, I've still got it, but mine's a little bit emptier, um, and they had the dignity, and they did it with dignity. The second person, and he's quoted as we come in, is Mark Twain. 
I see his books out there too, which I've been trying to buy for a fortnight, <laughs> and then I had to find the darn thing out there when I arrived to know. So he came to Ballarat, and he spoke at the Mechanics Institute, and he was wonderful. Just a little over the top, just a little American for um, my taste, but he got it right. And he said, what has happened here is massively important. This is a wonderful thing. Um, I am delighted to tell you about this revolution that's occurred here in this part of the world. Now, why did so many come? Well, I'll pitch this as high as I can pitch it. There's nothing higher than what I'm now going to say. The major political and philosophical question asked in the 19th century was addressed by the existence of Ballarat. That's what I'm going to argue for the next 40 minutes. Now, what I'm saying is in the 20th century, the intellectuals of the West went to Soviet Russia to see what happens when a society becomes communist. And basically they got conned, by the way, but <laughs> that's what they were doing in the 19th century. They're coming to Ballarat to see what happens if democracy is extended to every adult male. So let's not get too philosophical here. Here's the democracy defined as everyone has a say, everyone gets one vote. Well, we'll deal with the women about 1880 to 1900. In 1830, here's their definition. So in 1830 in Britain, you have tremendous pressure from people that say, we've made this country, we've produced its wealth, we're the industrialists, we're the merchants, we're the, in the professions, we demand a vote. They got it. So in 1832, in the Great Reform Act, 400,000 people voted before that Reform Act. It went to 600,000. <laughs> There's six million adult males in Britain at the time. They didn't extend it very far, did they? They didn't extend it to what, and I'll use another old-fashioned term, the working class. They didn't extend it to universal adult suffrage. They extended it to those that they could trust. And those that they could trust were property owners. Those that had a stake in the country. In the 1840s, there was a movement in Britain to extend it, to make that vote extend to every adult male. It's called Chartism. What happened? It was absolutely and totally defeated. In 1848, it was ruled out. These people don't have a stake in the country. These people are dangerous. Um, they'll waste it if they've got resources. And it was defeated. 1848. So that's the state of play when the Australian gold fields opened up. Now, we know what happened, don't we? We know what happened in Ballarat because it's no longer hypothetical. After 1851 and that whole decade, the working class do get money. They do get economic power. They do get wealth. I remind you, I'm well not remind you, I'm telling you, <laughs> if you don't know it in the first place, <laughs> that by 1860, five million ounces of gold has come out of Ballarat. That's $12 billion worth. Who owned it? The men that dug it up. There were no cabalists on Ballarat. None. They are cooperative parties. Four men down the Canadian, eight men at the bottom of Sovereign Hill, 24 men under, your, under the Bridge Mall in the deep sinking, 72 men at 
the old gravel pit mine in Lydiard Street. Governor Barclay went there on his tour in 1858 and they took him to the top mine in the world and that was the old gravel pit mine in Lydiard Street South and he couldn't believe it. The whole system was integrated. There was 500 pound pumps. Men earned about a pound or 10 shillings a week at that time. And there's pumps worth 400 pound operating. There's lifting gear. When the men worked underground in that mine, it's in Chantry Lane, that's where it was, no one touched that gold. It was shoveled into a truck. The truck went down the drive. It went up the shaft. It went out on a little train over the Dana Street Hill. It was dropped down into the, um, the puddlers down below and off they went. 72 men owned it. The 72 men who'd got that money working in Ballarat East. Now Barclay couldn't believe it. Absolutely, he kept asking it again and again and again. You're telling me that the operatives own this mine? Yes, that's what we're telling you. So Ballarat in 1858, 1860, answers the basic question. What will happen if you give ordinary men the vote? Now, the previous answer was Sodom and Gomorrah. What did we get? Well, Mount Pleasant, Soldiers Hill and Redan. Not quite Sodom and Gomorrah. Some of them probably went to the pub, and I understand Esmond Street was fairly interesting. But you have a look at what happened between 1855 and 1860, and you'll see that what these men basically did, well, you don't need me to tell you, you just have to open that door and walk out there and go and have a look at it. That's what they did, because that economic power was transferred into political power. It always is. It's called the golden rule. Those that have the gold, they'll eventually make the rules. Honestly, if there's any generalisations in history, and I point out to you that generalisations are only generally true, you know, nine out of ten times, but by crikey, in this particular case, it was definitely true. Those men had dignity and they had wealth and they converted that wealth into political power as well as economic power. Fancy me saying that in the Eureka Centre. Of all places. <laughs> So that's part of the story, but it's more than that. There's a, a city council, so they control Ballarat. The mining regulations, the government simply said, we give up, we can't administer this. Run the damn thing yourself, you smart Alex. So they did. They elected them. The mining regulations are designed by the miners. Ballarat is run by the miners. They get the vote. When they had big meetings in Ballarat to decide on some of these issues, 6,000 of them turn up, not on Bakery Hill, up in Lydiate Street, up on Dana Street, because the story has moved. It's moved from Ballarat East to Ballarat West. Right, all those in favour of this, and that's the way you voted. You held up your miners right. All those against? And if you just stuck your hand up, well, they would have bashed you up. Um, you voted because you had the miners' right that said every adult male uh, who owns one of these uh, is entitled to vote. So what had happened there was that now we've got Ballarat uh, being the living example of what happens if you give the working class the vote. Humphrey lectured, and he's my hero, Humphrey lectured in 1956, I think it was, at the um, Temperance Hall, next to St Paul's in Humphrey Street, and he got stuck into them. And he said, um, what, what is needed here are libraries, more schools, more churches that, that well, they can't fit them in, um, uh, we need public gardens, we, and he listed all the things. And have a look at the foundation stones around Ballarat, on the Benev, on the hospital, on the Mechanics Institute, 
on the schools, on the churches, and what you will find is what they did with their money and their political power. And that is, they produced a democratic community. That's how they, that's where that money came from. They made those decisions. They built public libraries, public gardens. Before, these are the sort of things that only the wealthy people would have had access to. They would have been private gardens, private libraries. Not in Ballarat, they weren't. Not in Ballarat. So power had been transferred. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing that in Ballarat there was a democratic heaven. There's no such thing <laughs> as a democratic heaven. But I tell you what, what they did create was a hell of a lot better than what they found here that actually produced uh, that better uh, society. Who did? Well, let me talk about one or two of the leaders. They're basically Geelong blokes, as a matter of fact. But R.T. Vale was one of the best ones. And R.T. Vale at the 1901 celebrations for Ballarat's 50 years of discovery of gold, the chairman stood up and tried to make a joke of it and said, well, <laughs> you know, the young these days, they're just not up to the quality of the blokes that came here in 1850. It's a bit disappointing, but what can you do? And he was trying to make a joke of the whole thing. They weren't amused. Not only were the young people not amused, neither were the group that came out in the 1850s. Neither was Oddy and people like that. Here's what Vale said. He was proud to be one of the 200,000 men who came out here and helped build this land and let him tell his friend, the chairman, that in the early 50s, there was not a town in Victoria that didn't have a hospital, a benevolent asylum, a library. These men came after gold, but they were thoughtful men men who lived for something better. He also added a race course. <laughs> he also said the sign of civilization was not only a library and all the rest of the things, but a race course, because Ballarat had three. <laughs> Ballarat had three. The minus race course, the one at Burren Beach and the one at Dowling Forest. Those were for squatters. The one in the minus race course down in Redan was the one that he was actually talking about. Now, the council itself, that's a bit of a sad story, isn't it, why we've got two of them? But they actually got together long enough to produce a four-page document, or whatever it is here, outlining what they had done. And here are their great pride. This is 1861. In the last five years, we've put in 109 streets, there are 27 chapels, there are um, 1,100... 69 males and 989 girls in schools. There's a town hall, the number of telegraphs received, and so on for four pages. They were proud of this thing that they had produced. Now, what if I'm wrong? What if what I'm saying is a, a mad exaggeration or it's a sham or simply not true? Well, aren't we putting in at the moment to be World Heritage listed as a gold fields area? If what I'm saying is not true, well, it's not worth paper it's written on. But it is true. Mind you, we'll also have to prove that we value it, <laughs> protect it, and we'll defend it. And that might be a little bit harder to prove at the moment, but uh, that is what on earth we will have to do. We are claiming in that report that is being prepared that something special happened here. Now, we're not claiming that our trees or our land is more beautiful than anything else, so therefore we should be a World Heritage Site for geographical reasons. We're not claiming that, look, I lived here as a little kid and I really, 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 really like Ballarat, so can we be a World Heritage Area and the tourist dollar would be good? We can't say that. What we have to say is, if Runnymede can be a blooming well World Heritage Area, because they bounced the ball for uh, democracy, so can we. Because the story here, the narrative is, is that we extended this thing 
and we picked the ball up when that was the size of democracy and we got it that far. So that's Ballarat case and I think it's absolutely uh, irrefutable. Right, well that's setting the scene. <laughs> I'd better get round to famous visitors. I'd better get round to this little book and, and talk you through some of these really, really interesting, quite interesting visitors uh, that I found. Now let me, let me start with Catpen Godfrey. Now Catpen Godfrey turns up, he's a sea captain, he turns up at Geelong five weeks into the gold rush. So he had no idea when he left the UK that this was going on on the other side of the world. He's in the Statesman, that's the name of his ship, and he turns up five weeks into the gold rush at Geelong with 300 very, very excited and pretty happy people <laughs> to find that 40 mile up the road is the world's greatest gold field. And um, Captain Godfrey was incredibly popular in Geelong, and I'll tell you why because he beat the world record for London to um, Australia by a huge margin, something like a fortnight. He did it in 77 days. He found a shortcut from London to Geelong. He took the Great Circle route. It had been taught to that generation of captains, but uh, no one was prepared to have a go. He did. He went back to um, London and said, I've done it in 77 days, when he went to Adelaide the year before. And they said, well, don't do it again. <laughs> it's a fluke and we don't believe you. He's standing there with the Adelaide paper on his hands to prove what, how long he's taken and all the rest of it, but he's still ruled out. So the second journey, he takes 120 days. The third one, uh, obviously the ship owners got to him, and they altered it, and he did this thing, and he did it in 77 days. But of course, when he got to, and they said, let's have a big banquet for him, let's celebrate this wonderful man who's cut the distance between us and London, but they couldn't find any cooks to cook the meal because they were all in Ballarat at the time. And he couldn't find anybody to unload his ship. His sailors stayed loyal to him, but no lightermen, no men to unload the ship. So, okay, while we wait, well, I do. I tell you what, we'll take you all to Ballarat. So Captain Godfrey and all the ship's crew come to Ballarat and he paid Ballarat its greatest ever compliment. He said, this is as, quite as good as the Great Exhibition of London. Now, you cannot get greater praise from anybody than that. He also called it an ant heap, which is a fairly accurate description of the thing. So he was one of the first to come. Then I wondered about Edward Hargraves, you know, this Australian who went to California, found out how you actually get gold and gravel, uh, gold out of gravel, found out where you should actually look for the darn stuff, like near courts, and he came back to New South Wales and he started the Australian gold rush, the father of the Australian uh, gold rushes. New South Wales gives him 500 quid, and says, go down and have a look at Victoria and write a report on it. So down he comes, first door he knocks on is the state government and says, oh, I'm going up to Ballarat and these places to have a look. Could I have a $5,000 reward? <laughs> 5,000 pound reward. So up he comes to Ballarat to have a look at what's here. He wasn't a miner's bootlace, this bloke, but by crikey, he was a good publicist. And there was two things he published gave great publicity to. One is Hargraves himself. My horse will be stuffed and put in the British Museum. I will be knighted. And he played that card brilliantly, but he also had two insights into gold, which was fantastic. Up until 1850, they hesitated. They weren't sure whether a gold rush was a good thing. Ooh, what with all the convicts, what with all the difficulties, oh, it'll send prices through the roof. Should we really exploit it if we find it? Hargraves had no doubts at all. He had seen what gold had done in California and he also knew a second thing 
nothing on God's earth will stop it. Because the police will be halfway up to Ballarat when you're telling them to arrest these people. On the back of the first licences, it says something about, um, you can buy this licence if you've got written permission from your employer. So how many blokes do you reckon went to their boss and said, I think I'll go to Ballarat and I might come back? None. Zero. So that you cannot stop it. Once you light this fire, this thing will happen. So up he comes to Ballarat. And where does he go? He goes to the centre of the universe at the time, Eureka. And I'm so, sorry to tell you, it's not here where you're sitting at the moment. It's Little Bendigo. Because in Little Bendigo in 1852, they had found the underground rivers. And the first one they found they called the Eureka Lead. It comes down under Russell Square, past the orphanage, down to where you're sitting at the moment, and then it does a nasty right hand turn down Eureka Street until it hits Main Road at the Eureka Main Road corner. He missed that. He's talking to all these miners who have made one of the greatest breakthroughs in, in human history, if you ask me, and he missed it. This is not done by science. Science doesn't teach these blokes anything. This is taught, and the miners knew it, by their own experience. They knew and understood this because they worked it out. So after 52, we think there's buried rivers under Ballarat and that's where the gold is. Let's try at the bottom of Sovereign Hill. And what do they find? The Lady Hotham, the Sarah Sands, um, the two Canadian nuggets. They find millions of ounces of gold. That's where it was. There's 37 kilometres of buried rivers under Ballarat and the boys at Eureka, at Little Bendigo, worked that out in 1852. Ed, Edward Hargraves didn't pick it. Now, let me jump over all around the place now. So let's now go to the 1890s. We get Sir Henry Parks here. Now, he's drumming up support for Federation and uh, up he goes on the usual tour, as I said, around the lake, etc. And then they take him to Victoria Park. Not to play cricket. What's he doing up there? What do you think of this for a site for the new capital? So they're suggesting that this could be, why don't we plant two oak trees? Um, and you can plant one for New South Wales and one will be planted for from the Victorians and these will be called the Federation Oaks and they were planted at the start of uh, Victoria Park where the big cannons are, I think. I'd love to find the exact spot. Who planted the Victorian one? Ballarat's first lady doctor and that's R.T. Vale's niece, Dr. Grace Vale. So she planted it. Back she came in 1898 when they were taking another set of politicians around and those Federation Oaks were going really well. Anybody seen them lately? I don't know where they are. If anybody honestly knows which ones they are or what happened to them, I would be delighted to find out. Right, now let's move up to World War I. Edward Hargraves, Cody Gold, Edward, here we go, World War I. When World War I started, the, there was a federal election going on in Ballarat, in Australia, I beg your pardon, and both the federal uh, men, um, Fisher, the Labor man, and Cook, the Prime Minister at the time, came here to speak. Where did they speak? At Ballarat's biggest auditorium. We now came inside out of the weather. This is the Coliseum. And Cook spoke to 6,000 people. A crowded and noisy meeting. Mr Fisher, the Labor bloke, he spoke at the same place and again it was absolutely packed. The next day Cook goes to stall because we're a railway centre and the other fellow takes the train down to Colac. And that's where Fisher made that. He, he spoke for about an hour and a half and it was about taxation and inflation and stuff that nobody remembered one word. But in his last 
paragraph in his last minute. He said, there's a bit of trouble on the other side of the world, and if there comes to it, we will help the motherland to the last man and the last shilling. And that created, to everybody banged their umbrella sticks, which is the way they showed that they were thought that was really good. And so the other side thought they better copy that, and off they went. Right, then Cook came back to Ballarat from stall, and then he was staying at Craig's, private, Craig's Hotel when he got a telegram. And that's when he finally realised that we're not going to get out of this, that all those other emergencies that have happened in Europe in some places that I can't find and I can't be bothered with, they all blew over. But I tell you, Cook was having his evening meal at Craig's private, <laughs> Craig's hotel when they handed him this telegram. He read it, changed colour, cancelled all these other uh, engagements and took the train back to Melbourne. It, and that was where he found out that what was going to happen was uh, Australia was going to be involved in this horrific event. Now, the decision wasn't made in, in Ballarat or there's nothing about Ballarat that adds to it, but I've got not the shadow of doubt that that crucial moment when this man realised, my God, and you, you, you know, from 1900 to 1914, they were golden years. They were absolutely fantastic. These, you have a look at round Ballarat, at those federation buildings around the town. There's money, there's pleasure. It's just gorgeous. But they knew that that was just going to plummet, that that was going to end. He then he came back. This is an amazing thing. In 1914, Fisher, he won the election. He comes back to Ballarat. Now, you would have thought that with war started, perhaps he better get back to, to Melbourne and sort the troops out. No, 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 no. It was a far more important matter. He was committed to and he was definitely going to do it. Mr Fisher expressed pleasure at being present and said that the cultivation of art and of the mind was of greater value even than the highest duty of defending the Commonwealth. And that's why he was here today at the Coliseum in front of 6,000 people to open South Street. South Street is the biggest, the biggest thing by far. It is unbelievable. If you were a Prime Minister of Australia and you didn't open South Street, you had no hope at the next election, I tell you. Right through those people came to Ballarat. South Street just absolutely dominated and Deacon set it up. He opened the first hall in South Street and he opened the Coliseum, because that's owned by, by South Street in Little, uh, by the South Street mob, uh, in Little Bridge Street. In 1916, who opened the South Street competitions? Who was Prime Minister of Australia in 1916? Now, what a weirdo situation this is. This bloke is Prime Minister of the country, but his party has disowned him. He doesn't control the numbers in the parliament, and yet he's Prime Minister. It's Billy Hughes. Okay, he's gone for conscription. He's been thrown out of the Labor Party, but he comes to Ballarat to open South Street. And he is Prime Minister, but doesn't control the parliament. Now, nothing holds Billy back, absolutely nothing. So he rips in. At the civic de dinner tendered to him before the evening meeting, Hughes uh, welcomed the sifting of the grain from the chaff, chaff in the Labor's ranks. He maintained that Labor, like every other great movement, must be purged, and he expressed his gratification that the best man in the party was standing by him. Now, you can imagine what happened. Well, after people tried to throttle him and the other part tried to carry him around the rumours, <laughs> he just caused bitter, bitter, bitter division. Peacock and Willie Watt, these are the Conservatives, they talk such silly rot. Iceberg Irving looks sad. He's gone conscription mad. Oh, what a silly lot. What a rotten lot. The win the war party. And that's what you would have heard at the Galloway Monument 
in 1916 when Billy was being carted around uh, the area. Let me now go to the most surprising one because I had to check this. I thought somebody was setting me up. In, in 1911, the Titanic goes down and Katie Gold turns up in Ballarat and she is the last female, she's a stewardess, rescued from the Titanic. Now, because of her surname Gold, I thought, oh, rubbish. I'm being set up here. I can't believe it. So when I was in Belfast at the Titanic Museum, I asked them about Katie Gold, and sure enough, this is absolutely correct. So the last woman, she stayed only for a brief period of time because, I don't know, her family seems to have run Ballarat at the time. It's absolutely incredible, all the people that were here. Uh, William Longton, who was part of the famous Sailors' Party, Sailors' Gully, and was in charge of the Victoria United Mine, Victoria Street, was her uncle, and she went there to live with him. Another one was in charge of the post office, and another one was the head bloke at the railway station. So this mob had a stranglehold on <laughs> this particular city at the time. Katie only stays about 12 months. Off she goes around the, the country, and she goes around the country um, with her uncle, and she finds a man in Sydney and spent the rest of her life alive there um, and died about 1949. She didn't tell the story in Ballarat. Pity, isn't it? Because we've got the bandstand, the Titanic bandstand. My God, I wish she'd been there to open that. She wasn't. Last Saturday, I was on duty at the library in Bunyong, tourism thing, and a 92-year-old came in. He said, I'm doing me family history. Uh, it's the Harlands. You heard of Harland and Wolf? I said, yes, they built the Titanic and all the Olympic-class ships. That's the family. I'm connected to them. I said, well, so why are you coming to the thing at Bunyong? <laughs> What's that got to do with it? Aren't you back in Belfast? No, the two brothers split. One of them stayed in Belfast and built a couple of ships the Titanic and the Olympic and all the rest of it, and the other brother came to the Victorian goldfield and died here in Scotchman's Lead, just outside Bunyan, where I live, as a man of 42 after a pretty unfortunate and unhappy life. Perhaps he should have stayed back. Now, I'm only 90% sure of this at the moment, but I don't understand why a 92-year-old man would walk into the Bunyan Cemetery and make this up. I took him to the grave and it is Robert Harland, and he nominated the, the religion that this fellow had and all the rest of it. So I'm pretty certain that I'll publish it a bit <laughs> once I'm a little bit more certain of the thing. Katie Gold, surely of all the people, he is the, the most unusual. The aeronauts, Wizard Smith, he turns up in 1912. The, the plane is brought to Ballarat on a cart. They go to the City Oval. Could six blokes step forward? Six blokes step forward. They lift it over the fence. Whoops. They lift it over the fence and away they go. He goes down to the southeast point post. They've got it down to the southeast point post. Then he revved her up and off they went. He gets halfway across the city oval, looked at the trees on the other side and said, this ain't going to happen. And he cut the engine and then he retried to start the engine. And as the newspaper said, it was a fizzer. A good old bonfire night expression, it was a fizzer. He couldn't get the darn thing to go. The 2,000 people who'd paid their couple of bob to go into the city oval booed. The 6,000 people who were standing round on the outside of the oval, <laughs> who did too mean to pay, thought it was hilarious. Wizard Smith, Wizard Stone, I mean, that's a bad name for a star, I would have thought, for an aeronaut. There's a great picture of him which I've used in the next book. There he is looking pretty debonair. There's his wife looking like uh, she's latched onto a good thing. And there's his five-year-old daughter with an appalling expression on her face saying, could somebody get me out of this plastic situation where I'm stuck with this lunatic of a father? <laughs> so down to... The Redan race course they went. 
You know what I'm talking about? Ray Raceway. And he did take off there. He did one lap and landed. So that's the first flight in Ballarat. After that, we got the whole lot, didn't we? Kingsford Smith came here. Kingsford Smith was a beauty because he took off how many times? In Ballarat, in one day, he did 42 flights in the Southern Cross. You got eight minutes. They loaded you in, round you went, down you came, next. And he did that 42 times in the Southern Cross. Not just any old plane, but the most famous plane in Australia's history. And this is with uh, Kingsford Smith in charge of the darn thing. And that was a record. No other city in Australia went anywhere near this. In my family, it's Bertie Hinkler, who is the famous one, another aviator, and he tried to land on the City Oval. He started off like that. Down he came, um, and off he went to the Miners Race Course. And he landed at the Miners Race Course, and he said, tomorrow afternoon I'll take off. Well, I wasn't born then, but Dad and all the other kids in my family went down, and I think Dad accidentally on purpose lost the dog, and we never found Rover again, and Dad was blamed for, well, he blamed Bertie Hinkler for actually pinching it. But I don't know, I'm not too sure about that particular story. Amy Johnson came here. She was welcomed by the Mayor, George Bolster, and she went straight on to Japarit where she said, by God, this is better, this is proper weather compared to that horrible Ballarat. She said, I would have stayed there in Ballarat overnight, but I couldn't find a bed that didn't have a bolster in it, so uh, I've had to keep going. Um, who else have we got? Well, I think we've, we've had a pretty good run of them. The most popular by far, I would have thought, was Dame Nellie Malva. She did two farewells here. She was famous for her farewells. We shouldn't make fun of it because the second time she came back, she came back and she was sick then, 1927. She was not well but she, because she loved South Street. The way she handled crowds was unbelievable. Ballar a day in Ballarat is the finest tonic in the world. Every newspaper had its headline. She loved it. She was at South Street all the time. And she came back and when South Street was in diabolical financial trouble, she gave a free concert when she was not a well woman. 800 pound was raised by that particular concert. Right. So in conclusion, I think Ballarat played a significant part in the extension of democracy. I think that's why so many visitors came to Ballarat. And I think that uh, Winston Churchill was right. He said, and we all know it, don't we? Democracy is the worst system of government ever invented, except for all the rest. But I would add, by a country mile, by a country mile. Ballarat is indeed worth knowing about. It's story, it's worth understanding. It's worth valuing, it's worth celebrating. Thank you.